In the previous lecture, we talked uh, primarily about Aristotle and his contributions with his crystalline sphere model, and how um, its, its success was in part dictated by Aristotle's success in, in other fields, and how even though it, it was considered the, the best model or the, the used model, um, it, it was known that there were inaccuracies in part because of people like um, Hipparchus who took better data and because the stars and planets positions never quite matched up with the predictions that were made by the model. So along comes Ptolemy and this was hundreds of years after Aristotle and uh, Ptolemy was Greek but he worked in Alexandria which was in Egypt uh, Egypt was uh, Greek at the time, and Alexandria also at this time had one of the man-made wonders of the ancient world, which was um, the the great library of uh, Alexandria. And by being in Alexandria with this library, Ptolemy had access to lots of data uh, that other astronomers had taken over over hundreds of years, including the, those taken by Hipparchus which tended to be extraordinarily accurate, at least in comparison to the other data taken at the, in this era. Uh, and so what Ptolemy did was he wrote this book um, called Almagest, which translated means the greatest, very modest fellow Ptolemy was, and this contained his compilation of previous measurements, including those from Hipparchus, and some measurements that he, he did on his own. And um, what he did and this is one flaw or problem, is sometimes he used, first of all, Hipparchus's numbers, which were very accurate, but also very accurate for several hundred, several hundred years earlier. And so by mixing and matching some of the data points, there, there was definitely some inconsistencies and some problems with um, the numbers that Ptolemy was working with, in terms of where the planets were located at different times and where the stars were located and so on. Um, and But what he did was he used this data to refine Aristotle's crystalline sphere model and try to account for some of the major issues. And one of the major issues was that whole retrograde motion uh, that we saw with Mars earlier uh, in, in the first lecture, where it appeared to be losing speed, um, losing ground to the fixed stars that were all moving at the same speed, and then it would gain ground on those stars again and, and so on back and forth back and forth um, so this was this was very weird and it was difficult to account for using just circles just circular orbits so what he did was Ptolemy sort of mastered this idea of using epicycles around a deferent and I'll show you what that is first because I think that uh, just telling you about it might not make sense so what we have here is an image of a epicycle around deferent. This is the deferent. Basically, here's the Earth, and here's Venus, and this signifies the orbit of Venus, more or less. Um, this might not be entirely to scale, by the way, but this is the orbit of Venus, but here's Venus, and so you might be wondering, how is this possible? Well, this is called the deferent. And this circle is called the epicycle. And epi means above or on top of. And really that's what that means. We've got a circle above or on top of another circle. And so what's going to happen is Venus is going to basically orbit the deferent. So it's going to go in a circle like this. While the deferent orbits the Earth. So this was kind of the clever way in the ancient times to keep the Earth in the center of the universe to make sure that everything was orbiting the Earth, but the actual objects themselves might be orbiting something else that's orbiting the Earth. In this case, there's nothing here. It's just an imaginary point that or orbits the Earth. So Venus isn't actually orbiting something else that's physically there. It's just orbiting around a point that orbits the Earth. And I'll show you what this looks like then. So this is, I guess we're doing a monthly period and we'll watch and you can see that Venus is rotating on the deferent and actually I want to turn trace on we'll start the trace from here and so what you can see happening is as Venus starts to get down towards this phase it's it's kind of moving backwards actually compared to the 
the fixed stars out here. And so it'll take this backwards motion and then it goes forward, it leaps forward actually, very, very rapidly up in this range because not only is the deferent moving forward, but Venus is moving forward along or compared to the deferent. Um, this is not the best of simulations. I'm going to try a different one. Uh, but I think this one clearly shows the, the basic idea of um, a planet going around another point that orbits the Earth. And this kind of shows the path that's going to take. But here's another one. Okay, here we have uh, Earth, and we have two objects orbiting it. And you can see that this one has... Uh, this is on an epicycle around a deferent. And its rate of motion, the deference rate of motion, is quite fast. With the result being that because the, the rate of motion of, along the epicycle is, is fairly slow, we get... Hold on. Apparently I only have a trial version, so we can't do this for very long. Um, we get a pretty smooth motion in terms of the speed, but it sometimes slows down a little bit when it's going backwards, sometimes leaps forward in terms of speed. This one, on the other hand, is moving very slowly or along the deferent, but about the same speed around the epicycle. And this results in lots of backwards sorts of motions. You also notice that the actual um, speeds, or actually the directions of, of rotation of the epicycles, is different. And so that results in different patterns. Uh, what this allowed someone like Ptolemy to do is to really better model the positions of the planets as they move faster and move slower compared to the other objects in the night sky, and sometimes, honestly, just move backwards compared to the other objects in the night sky. Um, so this was a very powerful tool. The biggest problem is that it didn't work. This is an image that you can find on Wikipedia, and it shows um, sort of the, the Ptolemaic model of the solar system with, well, they didn't call it the solar system, but here's the Earth in the center and the sphere of the prime movers uh, on the outside. And you can see this, this mixing and matching of, of different circles going on, um, leading to different motions of the planets and the stars. And here's the sun here which does actually go in a perfect circle, which is very nice. But the other ones are all bobby and, and bendy and wiggly in terms of their, their speeds. And this is still a fairly simplified uh, version of the, the final system because this is too regular. This isn't quite how the planets move. And here's just one more um, view of a planet um, going around an epicycle which is centered on a um, deferent, they call the center of the epicycle the deferent, and the deferent rotates around the actual Earth. Um, but as I said, this didn't quite work out. So if one epicycle didn't work, he would throw another epicycle on top of the original epicycle. So you'd have not just one circle on another circle, you'd have maybe one circle on another on another, or you could have even like four epicycles. Um, in any case, he had five major epicycles, one for each of the, the planets to account for the major um, retrograde motion. And then he added lots of other epicycles to account for some of the minor quirks that occurred. Uh, he also did some, some interesting things, which was he added the equant. Um, and this was strange, because what he did was he, the equant basically allowed him to make equal rates of rotation about a non-central point um, opposite the Earth. And the idea here, first of all, too, I guess I should say, is he used eccentrics, which means that he put the Earth off-center. And here's an image of that here. So basically, you have the center of the universe, and he's put the Earth slightly off-center. Actually, I, I should restate that. The Earth is the center of the universe, but the center of the orbit of the deferent is slightly different from where the Earth is located. And there's a point off to the side here, which is called the equant. And that's also very important um, because of, of something that, that Ptolemy did. So I'll try to uh, show this to you 
clearly in the next lecture. I don't want to take up too much more time on this lecture. But these are the basic tools that Ptolemy used. He used lots of epicycles and deference. That's the major thing that he did. And that was to account for the backwards and forwards motion of the planets and the, the variances in the speed um, with the different planets. Uh, he also put the orbits off-centered compared to the Earth. And he added something called an equant, which we'll, we'll explain in the next lecture.